Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Teaching CRISPR-Cas Genome Editing to Undergraduates, a Biotechnology Education Update, hosted by Wiley and the American Society for Microbiology Press. My name is Megan Angelini. I'm a Managing Developmental Editor for ASM Books, and we're so pleased that you can join us today. The webinar will highlight features from the recently published new edition of Molecular Biotechnology, Principles and Applications of Recombinant DNA by Bernard Glick and Cheryl Patton that facilitate teaching and learning and provide a bit of a deep dive into teaching the CRISPR-Cas system for genome editing. I want to note that all of you are in listen-only mode to cut out any background noise. However, we invite you to type your questions into the question box in your control panel so the presenter can address them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. The session is being recorded, and in a few days' time, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording. Additionally, you'll find a copy of the slides in the handout section of the webinar panel. Please allow me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Cheryl Patton. In addition to being one of the authors of Molecular Biotechnology, Dr. Patton is a professor of microbiology at the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, Canada. Her research involves using genomic, genetic, and biochemical approaches to identify bacterial signaling molecules that mediate bacterial colonization of roots and stimulate plant growth. Dr. Patton also teaches introductory biology, microbiology, and biotechnology. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Dr. Patton. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Megan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join the webinar. Uh, Dr. Bernie Glick and I are pleased to announce the publication of the new edition of our book, Bio, uh, Molecular Biotechnology. Uh, the book was first published in 1994 and is now in its sixth edition. And it's amazing to look back at the first edition and compare it to where we are now. Um, a great many developments have occurred in this field in the last 30 years. The book provides a comprehensive introduction to the subject of microbi uh, molecular biotechnology, and it's targeted mainly to senior undergraduate and graduate students. It includes detailed descriptions of the most important biotechnologies from the foundational technologies to recent advances. For example, we describe uh, didioxy sequencing or Sanger sequencing, which was one of the first DNA sequencing technologies developed in the 1970s, to more recent single molecule real-time sequencing and nanopore sequencing. We have provided many examples of applications in medicine, agriculture, industry, and the environment from early to very recent discoveries. We have highlighted noteworthy discoveries in milestone boxes, such as the development of the polymerase chain reaction by Kerry Mullis, and included special interest boxes that can be used to generate discussion with your students. For example, about the anti-vaccine movement or about the debate over genetically engineered crops. So today, I will illustrate how the book might be used to teach a topic in molecular biotechnology. And for this, we've chosen to illustrate, uh, we've chosen to illustrate this using the CRISPR-Cas system. We are just on the threshold of an explosion of applications using this technology, and it's important that students understand the system. The CRISPR-Cas system is a popular research tool to introduce transgenes or mutations in prokaryotic and eukaryotic genomes or to control gene expression in these organisms. An important example is the generation of animal models of human disease. The technology is being used to improve production traits in crops and livestock, many of which are described in the book. For example, a CRISPR-edited fish, the red sea bream, that grows larger than conventional fish uh, was recently approved for human consumption in Japan. So this technology holds great promise as a treatment for human diseases, many of which are currently in early clinical stage, or, or early stage clinical trials to treat diseases such as uh, genetic blood disorders, sickle cell disease being one, uh, blood cancers, inherited blindness, to name a few. 
The CRISPR-Cas system is a, is a bacterial immune system that protects bacteria against bacteriophage infection and foreign DNA. The CRISPR acronym stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, which refers to repeat sequences in a region of the bacterial chromosome known as the CRISPR array shown here, the, the repeats are shown here in the array in gray. In fact, it was the observation of this unusual cluster of repeats that led to the discovery of the CRISPR-Cas system. Adjacent to these repeats, but not shown here, are genes encoding CRISPR-associated proteins or Cas proteins that mediate the activity of the system. So during an infection, shown here in panel A, Cas proteins incorporate fragments of bacteriophage genomes, known as protospacers, um, into the CRISPR array between the repeats. In the array, these are known as spacers and they're shown here as colored boxes. On subsequent infection, shown in panel B, the array is transcribed to produce a long pre-CRISPR RNA molecule, which is processed by an RNAs to produce CRISPR RNA or CRNA shown here in orange. The mature CRISPR RNA is bound by a Cas endonuclease and guides the complex to invading complementary uh, DNA or RNA, depending on the system, and the endonuclease cuts the invading nucleic acid. Some Cas endonucleases cut both strands of the double-stranded DNA, and some cut only one of the two strands. Note here, that the target cleavage site must be adjacent to a short sequence known as a PAM or protospacer adjacent motif. And so at this point, if I was teaching a class, I might ask the class why the system has evolved to require a PAM for target cleavage. And so the answer is, of course, that it avoids cleavage of the bacterium's chromosome. Uh, in the corresponding spacer in the CRISPR array, which is homologous to the invading nucleic acid, but does not contain a PAM, does not contain the PAM sequence. So thus the, the bacterial CRISPR-Cas system has functional similarities uh, to the mammalian immune system. It provides protection against foreign, a foreign invader. It has memory as the CRISPR array contains a record of past infections. And it is adaptable in that new spacers can be acquired and added to the array. In addition, immunity is heritable as the array is passed on to offspring during cell division. For those interested in how new technologies develop, uh, we've included a milestone box describing the development of the CRISPR-Cas system as a genome editing tool um, from the initial observation of the clustered repeats in bacterial genome sequences by Japanese PhD student Yoshizumi Ishino in the, in the 1980s, and then Spanish PhD student Francisco Mojica, who coined the term CRISPR to describe the array. Many researchers have contributed to the development of, of the genome editing technology, including Jennifer Doudna's group at the University of California, and Emmanuel Charpentier's group at the University of Vienna, who worked out the mechanism by which the CRISPR system destroys target DNA. They determined that uh, three molecules are sufficient for genome editing at a targeted site by the relatively simple CRISPR-Cas system of the bacterium Streptococcus pyogenes. And, and so these three molecules are the CRISPR RNA, a transactivating CRISPR RNA that activates the RNAs to process the CRISPR RNA, and Cas9 endonuclease. And Doudna and Charpentier received the Nobel Prize for this work in 2020. So how does the system function as a genome editing tool? Well, it's facilitated by trimming and fusing the two RNA molecules 
to generate a single guide RNA. So the two, just to remind you, the two RNA molecules that I'm referring to here are the CRISPR RNA and the transactivating RNA. So they are trimmed and fused together to generate a single guide RNA. Uh, and this is shown in panel A here. Um, so vectors are available that contain much of the coding sequence, uh, uh, much of the sequence encoding the single guide RNA. And researchers can insert a 20 nucleotide sequence shown here in orange, that following expression targets the single guide RNA to a specific DNA sequence in the genome. And so that's shown in panel B. Um, the target sequence is shown in blue, and that's adjacent to a PAM, which is shown here in red. The Cas9 nuclease is most often employed, and its gene may be, it may be included on the vector with the gene for the single guide RNA and introduced into a host cell for expression. Or alternatively, the two molecules, the single guide RNA and the Cas9 uh, protein, may be introduced as RNA molecules with Cas9 mRNA translated in host cells, or they can be introduced as a ribonucleoprotein complex of single guide RNA and the Cas9 protein. So Cas9 recognizes the trinucleotide PAM NGG and generates a double-stranded break in the target sequence, which is represented here as an arrow as a double arrow. Um, the damage to the DNA triggers repair systems in the host. So either non-homologous end joining or homology directed repair. And these re repair processes have different outcomes with respect to genome editing, which we will look at now. So re repair by non-homologous end joining is error prone and it tends to introduce mutations at the target site. The cleaved ends of the DNA are rejoined, but in the process, additional nucleotides are added or deleted, and these are known as indels. In the figure shown here, which is a, a real life example, a single guide RNA targets the sequence in an exon, shown here in green, that is adjacent to a PAM, shown here in red, and after repair by non-homologous uh, end joining, nucleotides were added at the targeted site in some chromosomes shown in blue and deleted in other chromosomes. And these are the deletions are represented as dots. In some cases, these indels uh, introduced a premature stop codon into the exon, and these are underlined. These uh, changes altered, these nucleotide changes altered the amino acid sequence of the expressed proteins, in some cases producing a truncated protein, and the uh, partial amino acid sequences are shown here in the right column. So repair of, double -stranded DNA, of a double-stranded DNA break by homology-directed repair results in incorporation of a transgene into the target site when the, trans, the transgene is provided on an introduced uh, DNA fragment. The transgene, shown in green, on the donor DNA is flanked by sequences that are, are homologous to the target site in the recipient chromosome. And these homologous sequences are shown here in gray. The donor DNA serves as a repair template and is incorporated into the chromosome by homologous re recombination, which is represented in this figure as Xs. So this figure, which is, is in the book, summarizes the strategies for introducing mutations, shown in panel A, indels, shown in panel A, or excising sequences, shown in panel B, by uh, non-homologous end joining, or for introducing transgenes by homology-directed repair when donor DNA is introduced either on a vector in panel C or a single-stranded oligonucleotide shown in panel D. 
I should point out here that I have illustrated genome editing using the Cas9 endonuclease. There are several other types of CRISPR-Cas systems from other bacteria that have different activities and have also been harnessed for genome editing. Also, uh, Cas9 has been modified, genetically modified, uh, and in some cases fused to other proteins for different purposes. Um, for example, to activate or repress uh, expression but not cleave target genes, or to nick only one DNA strand and make a single base change. Um, the latter are known as base editors. So let's work through an example using the CRISPR-Cas system uh, to correct a mutation that causes Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, this disease is caused by mutations in the dystrophin gene that disrupt the function of the dystrophin, dystrophin protein uh, that mediates attachment of the extracellular matrix to the actin cytoskeleton. And the disease destroys skeletal, respiratory, and cardiac muscles and decreases life expectancy. In most affected affected individuals, the reading frame of the dystrophin gene is disrupted by deletions in exons. And so these individuals may be candidates for corrective gene therapies, either to replace the defective exon with a functional copy or to delete the defective exon to restore the reading frame. And so these strategies were tested in a mouse model, in most models of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, known as MDX mice, that have a point mutation, shown here in red, in exon 23, that results in a premature stop codon and therefore a truncated and non-functional dystrophin protein. The, defects, the defective exon can be replaced with a functional copy uh, using the CRISPR-Cas system. So a single guide RNA targets the mutation in exon 23, so shown represented here in a shown highlighted here is in the red arrow, which is adjacent to a PAM, and the donor DNA is introduced on a single-stranded oligonucleotide that will replace the stop codon uh, with a codon encoding the amino acid glutamine. The single guide RNA here, the donor DNA, and the Cas9 protein are injected into the male pronucleus of early stage MDX mice embryos. And the embryos are then introduced into a foster mum uh, to give birth to transgenic pups. And I just want to let you know that the uh, generation of transgenic mice by DNA microinjection, as well as by other methods, is described in detail, in more detail, in uh, Chapter 12 of the book. In several of the transgenic offspring, the stop codon was successfully replaced with glutamine by homology-directed repair. And I like to show students the supporting evidence from the original research articles. And we, in the book, we have included references for our examples uh, at the end of each chapter. Uh, so you can find them if you're interested in that. Uh, in this case, PCR was used to amplify the target region in exon 23. And then the PCR products were digested with the restriction endonuclease TSE1 and resolved by gel electrophoresis as shown in the image. The sizes of the restriction enzyme digested fragments differ between the mutant and corrective, corrected alleles. And uh, these are indicated here by the, the two sizes are indicated here by the blue and uh, red arrows. So in six of the mice, the corrected alleles, corrected alleles were indeed detected in the muscle tissue, and these are indicated by the lower bands and the red arrow. Um, and so uh, 
two bands are apparent in samples from five of the six mice. And this indicates that these mice carry both the corrected alleles and the mutant alleles. And so these mice are referred to as mosaics. Um, the intensity of the bands tells you the relative proportion of each allele in the mice. And so in these transgenic mice, two to 100% of the alleles were corrected um, as, and, and that's indicated here at the bottom of the figure. So here, uh, you might ask your students how mosaicism occurs. Um, and so it's due to differences in the timing of transgene integra integration into the genome uh, during the development of the embryo. Fewer cells will carry the transgene if integration occurs after DNA replication. So that example describes germline editing in, in the mice, uh, genomic changes in reproductive cells that can be passed on to future generations. This is currently not allowed in humans, although it has been done. If you are interested in having a discussion with your students about the various perspectives on human germline editing, you might have them read the special interest box, which we have included in chapter 13. So while human germline editing is currently not allowed, uh, therapeutic somatic cell genome editing in humans using the CRISPR-Cas system is regulated as for other gene therapies. And as I mentioned earlier, several clinical trials for various diseases are in progress. It may be possible to correct the dystrophin gene only in muscle cells using the CRISPR-Cas system. For example, the uh, defective exon could be excised using two single guide RNAs that target uh, flanking introns. So excision of the exon uh, carrying uh, the premature stop codon would restore the reading frame, uh, leading to production of a partially functional dystrophin protein. An adeno-associated virus vector uh, was used to deliver the single guide RNA and Cas9 genes for expression, expression in muscle cells of MDX mice. And the defective exon was deleted from about 60% of the cells in, muscle, in the muscle tissue, restoring some muscle function. So here you might generate some discussion with your students about the limitations of somatic cell genome editing, such as um, the correction of a sufficient number of cells to have a meaningful effect, the potential for off-target effects, um, and the possibility that the recipient's immune system may respond to the vector, in particular when a viral vector is used to deliver the CRISPR system. So in the book, we have included many other examples of applications using the CRISPR-Cas system, as I have listed here on this slide. Um, and so instructors can choose the examples that they are most interested in and that fit with the focus of their course. And so finally, the CRISPR-Cas system, as for other molecular biotechnologies, has enormous commercial potential and patent protection for their lucrative inventions are typically sought by the individuals who develop these technologies. And if you are interested in discussing the patent dispute over the CRISPR technology with your students, uh, there is a special interest box describing this in chapter 13 of the book. Um, essentially, the crux of the dispute was over who was the first to demonstrate the utility of the system in, as a genome editing tool. Um, and so utility is one of the three criteria for a patentable product or process. Okay, that's, uh, I want to thank you very much for listening and I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Cheryl. 
So we're uh, now going to move on to the question and answer portion of the webinar. We've had some great questions come through in the chat and uh, the listeners can continue to add those in as we move along. Um, and we've got some time to answer them. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, so the first question that I'm gonna ask you, Cheryl, is are there any particular issues or limits of the CRISPR-Cas system that has researchers still trying to develop or find new systems for genome editing? Oh, uh, most definitely. Um, so one of the big concerns uh, is off-target effects. Um, although there, and there are new developments to try and limit these. Um, and so off-target effects are sequences elsewhere in the genome. Uh, off-target sites are sequences elsewhere in the genome that are similar to the intended target, and there's the potential for the Cas nuclease, for the guide RNA to target Cas nuclease to cleave at that site. Um, of course, the, the requirement for a PAM does help in that regard because the Cas protein does quickly dissociate um, if there is no PAM from, from those sites. Um, yeah, there certainly are new systems that are being explored. More and more uh, CRISPR-Cas systems are being identified and investigated uh, from other bacterial genomes. And um, certainly there are, uh, the, the existing systems are being genetically modified to improve on the system, yeah. That's one of the biggest concerns are the off-target effects, but also the on-target effects. So the degree of damage and, and the extent of changes that are made, especially during non-homologous end joining, um, yeah, in some cases might want to be limited. And there are base editors that have been developed that are seem to show promise to limit, limit some of that um, damage at that site, some of the unintended nucleotide changes at that site. Hey, thanks. Um, the next question that I'm seeing here is, uh, what are the differences between the various different Cas proteins? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Yeah, so um, some of the Cas proteins, like Cas9, uh, uh, cleave double-stranded DNA. Some of the, uh, some of them, uh, cleave RNA, some of them cleave, uh, and Cas12A is a good example of that. Some of them cleave, will uh, bind to double-stranded DNA, but cleave only the non-complementary strand, the, the strand that's not complementary to the CRISPR uh, uh, RNA, uh, which hybridizes with, that hybridizes with the CRISPR RNA. They recognize different PAM sequences, um, yeah, those are those are the main differences, and they've been harnessed for different applications. Some of them, um, one in particular that's interesting is the uh, CRISPR 12A. Sorry, I think I got that mixed up. The CRISPR, sorry, the Cas13 recognizes um, RNA. The CRISPR, uh, the Cas12A is really interesting because it binds to uh, double-stranded DNA, but it cleaves indiscriminately uh, nearby single-stranded DNA. And so that's actually been harnessed uh, as a diagnostic tool. Yeah. Excellent. There's so many questions coming through, I'm just sorting <laughs> through them. Yeah. Um, so here's some, uh, sort of a more general question just about teaching this, these topics. So how do you incorporate practical aspects while teaching molecular tools to students? Practical aspects, so uh, in uh, I don't teach a lab, um, although I can envision how one would be, could be taught. Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by practical aspects. Uh, as I pointed out in one of the slides, I, I really like to include data from research papers. Um, I like to show the evidence to support the conclusions um, that I'd present during lecture. And so I do this very often. 
and uh, show students uh, data. It's also a good opportunity to uh, teach them about some of the techniques that we use in molecular biotechnology. Um, and uh, yeah, it takes a bit of time when you include those. It takes a bit of time in your lectures, but I think it's definitely worthwhile. There are a lot of misconceptions in the world today. And so I think it's really important to show evidence to support uh, scientific discoveries. Great. Um, next one that I'm seeing here is, uh, when you mention how the CRISPR-Cas is used as a bacterial defense system, uh, was this primarily to protect the bacteria against bacteriophages? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, no, not solely. Um, also from other invading DNA, so uh, plasma DNA, I think has been um, uh, one uh, that is also to often targeted, um, but certainly it's well known as a uh, as to provide protection against bacteriophage. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, is CRISPR a better alternative than traditional homologous recombination for mutant generation in gram-positive bacteria? Oh, okay. Um, hmm, good question. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I don't really work, I don't work at all with gram-positive bacteria. My, the organisms that I work with are all gram-negative bacteria, so I'm not actually, I don't have any practical experience uh, using the CRISPR system for gram-positive bacteria. Um, I don't see, yeah, I don't see, well, actually, no, um, well, it should work. I mean, certainly Streptococcus pyogenes is gram-positive uh, gram bacterium. So it should work. Is it any better or worse or, or more difficult or less efficient? I think it might involve fewer steps would be to streamline the process um, would, would be yeah, one reason to use it over other methods of um, homologous recombination, which are still certainly effective. And I use them in my lab. Um, traditional homologous recombination to incorporate transgenes into the genomes of the bacteria that I work with. Um, and so, yeah, certainly that's a good, still a very useful tool. The questions are really running the gamut from teaching about the topics to the book overall to like very specific uh, diving deep questions. Uh, these are great, so everyone keep them coming. Um, let's see, so what is the role of the MGG sequence near the PAM sequence? Yeah, that, it's really important. And so without that, um, the uh, CRISPR, the CAS, sorry, the CAS protein doesn't stay long on the target DNA. Um, so it's, it's an absolute requirement that has to be considered when, uh, when a person is uh, targeting, uh, gene editing genomes. Yeah, so, um, the uh, CRISPR RNA doesn't actually bind to that sequence. It just it binds to a sequence just upstream from the PAM, but the Cas9 protein does, and so um, it may interact with target sequences that don't contain a PAM, but it disassociates very rapidly, and so it's the binding of uh, so binding to the target sequence, including the PAM. Uh, alters the configuration of the uh, CRISPR protein uh, so that it can cleave the DNA. So it is, it's absolutely essential. But it's the, the NGG is the PAM that is recognized by the Cas9 protein from Streptococcus pyogenes and other bacteria, but the, there are other PAMs that are recognized by other Cas proteins. They're usually short nucleotide sequences. I'm seeing a number of questions in the chat that are sort of uh, asking about cell type things. So, um, so you, uh, one is just, is the expression of DCAS9 toxic to cells? It can be, it can be. Uh, yes, I have read, you know, that it can be. 
Um, and so, yeah, that that's the case for sure. Yeah. And then another one, uh, how would you compare success for modifying a tissue versus say hematopoietic stem cells? So the most of the clinical trials that have been initiated and and I from my understanding I think most of them are still in early early stages early phase 1 2 clinical trials um so most of those have been what are referred to as um ex vivo gene therapies and so in those cases the uh, and and mainly to um to treat uh, blood disorders, um, so genetic disorders like sickle cell disease and um, beta thalassemia. And so in those cases with ex vivo uh, gene therapy, the stem cells, the blood stem cells, the hematopoietic cells are uh, removed from the body and then they are edited using the CRISPR-Cas system or other technologies um, and then uh, they are re those stem cells, the engineered stem cells are reintroduced back into the blood um, after uh, chemotherapy to destroy the existing uh, cells, uh, blood cells in the individual. And so they're re the genetically engineered, the gen genome edited stem cells are reintroduced back into the individual. Um, and so to repopulate. And so that has, in a way you can, although there it has not probably been easy to develop that technology, really in a way it's the low hanging fruit. Um, much more difficult is uh, targeting. Um, so, and, and so let me just add that there, there are now some clinical trials that have been initiated for in vivo therapies. Uh, one of the first ones in that regard was the uh, trial to correct mutations in um, a gene uh, that encodes a photoreceptor, so in the retina of the eye, and so mutations in that photoreceptor cause blindness. Um, some of you may know about Lieber uh, congenital amaurosis, and so um, yeah, but the, the eye is contained, um, and so both of those therapies, the ex vivo therapy with hematopoietic stem cells and the in vivo therapies uh, in the eye are somewhat contained. So they it reduces the risk in these early stages with these trials, it re reduces the risk somewhat. But there are some trials uh, being proposed to, to begin um, for in vivo, more systemic therapies. Uh, so, and, and so and one of the big issues is how to deliver uh, the corrections uh, and, and target enough cells uh, to be corrected to make a big to make an, um, a meaningful difference for the individual. And so Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a good example. Uh, I mean, muscle cells are throughout the body, and so how do you target enough muscle cells to make a difference for the individual? Uh, so there there are still some things to overcome. How do you deliver uh, the uh, the system, the CRISPR-Cas system, the genome editing system. I can elaborate on that if anybody wants to. <laughs> would like. <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. Okay. Um, here's a here's a fairly straightforward one. Here, I believe. Uh, what is the difference between the crRNA and the TRAC RNA? I'm sorry if the, I'm pronouncing yeah. those wrong for the truth. Uh, which yeah. one targets the gene that you want to be modified? Yep, so that the, the targeting uh, uh, RNA is the CRISPR RNA, the crRNA, and that is transcribed from the spacer that was incorporated in that adaptation or acquisition phase of, um, of the, um, uh, dur at least during a natural infection in a, bac in a bacterial cell. So the 
the uh, CRISPR RNA uh, guides and targets the uh, Cas9 to the target site in, in the genome. The transactivating RNA or tracer RNA um, uh, helps, it, it, one of its main roles is to activate an RNAs in the bacterial cell to process the uh, pre-CRISPR RNA. So you may recall that um, I mentioned that in bacterial cells, the uh, initially it's the CRISPR RNA is, is carried on a long pre-CRISPR RNA transcript. And so that is cleaved and processed by an endogenous RNAs in the bacterial cell. It's very often RNAs three. And so that RNAs is activated by the transactivating CRISPR RNA. And then the transactivating CRISPR, the transactivating CRISPR RNA hybridizes to the CRISPR RNA and also uh, functions uh, in the complex of the uh, with the CRISPR protein as it's on the, on the uh, genome that it's editing. Um, and so in the case of, as a genome editing tool, uh, those two RNAs have been fused together just to simplify the system and the unessential nucleotides have been deleted just to make it more streamlined. All right, uh, I'm combining a couple of questions into one here. So how are CRISPRs used in diagnostics and can they be used in the field, particularly in low resource settings? Yeah, okay, so uh, one interesting uh, diagnostic way in which they can be used as a diagnostic tool is using the CRISPR-12, or sorry, the Cas12A protein. So in that case, um, the, uh, there's a single guide RNA as well. A guide RNA is included in that and is bound to the CRISPR, Cas12 uh, protein, 12A protein. And it, they are targeted to a particular sequence in a genome. So this would be genomic DNA that was extracted, uh, for example, from a sample or um, amplified. Um, and so the, um, and, and that Cas12A has uh, a collateral cutting ability. So it, it, in, it will cleave nearby single-stranded DNA. So included in that as a diagnostic system is a, a reporter uh, DNA, single-stranded reporter DNA that has at one end covalently bound a fluorophore, a fluorescent molecule, and at the other end is bound a quencher that absorbs the energy from the fluorophore. So in the uncleaved state, that a reporter uh, DNA does not fluoresce. But when the target sequence is present, as detected by the CRISPR RNA, the Cas12A is induced to cleave the reporter uh, DNA um, and separate the quencher and the fluorophore. And so in that case, then the fluorophore will emit fluorescence that can be measured. Yeah, and so this is the... Uh, detector technology. And so it's been adapted for a point of care diagnostic test in which the uh, the sample is mixed with this CRISPR, -Cas the CRISPR system and it flows by ca capillary action um, across a um, uh, let's call it a piece of paper. <laughs> and um, if there is no uh, target detected, uh, it uh, it is uh, that um, is uh, detected at a particular position in that uh, in that uh, little test strip test strip, let's call it. Um, and if the target DNA is present, then you, the fluorescence is detected. Great. 
um, a couple of questions uh, focused on actually teaching this topic. So uh, first, do you find it hard to teach this topic to undergrads since it entails them to be equipped with a few basic molecular biology concepts in order to understand? And have you found that there are certain portions of understanding this topic that tend to either trip students up or are particularly challenging for instructors? Yeah, so I, I teach the CRISPR-Cas system in my third year microbiology course. And, but I teach it as a bacterial immune system at that point. Um, I, I don't teach it as a genome editing tool until, well, they're actually third and fourth year students, but they require the microbiology course as a prerequisite for that course. So they, it's developed in, in, in my experience in, in, in steps. I have and, and certainly they don't have a problem understanding it. I have thought about taught, uh, teaching it to the first year biology students. It's, it's a bit trickier because they are still grappling with understanding a lot of the very basic concepts. Um, even things like transcription and uh, you know translation and DNA hybrid hybridization and, and basic concepts such as that. So I think it would be difficult, I don't think impossible, but I would certainly allow enough time. I wouldn't try to do it quickly if I was going to teach it to first year students. And that is one of the problems with teaching a first year bio introductory biology course is we cover so many topics that it's really hard to get into. It's really there's not really enough time to get into the more difficult topics. Um, but certainly at the third and fourth year level, I haven't. The students get it, and they are very interested because they're reading in popular scientific literature about this technology, and they're they're really keen to understand it. Yeah. Great. Um... So there's a number of questions in the chat that are sort of uh, focused on, on this general theme. Uh, could the Cas9 system in bacteria explain why some microbes may not acquire antimicrobial resistance genes? For example, plasmid DNA from conjugation is targeted by the CRISPR-Cas system. And is there a way to leverage the CRISPR-Cas system to help limit the spread of AMR in bacteria? Okay, and Megan, would you mind repeating that? Absolutely. Uh, could the Cas9 system in bacteria explain why some microbes may not acquire antimicrobial resistance genes? For example, plasmid DNA from conjugation is targeted by the CRISPR-Cas system. Yeah. And if so, is there a way to leverage to, to help limit the spread of AMR in bacteria? Oh yes, yeah, certainly. So that that may, you know makes sense, right? So it, it for but that, I mean really that's only for plasmids that the uh, for which the bacterium has a, a spacer has acquired a spacer for, um, and so certainly n not all um, plasmids may have corresponding spacers incorporated into the array in the bacterial genome. So they still could acquire some antimicrobial resistance, certainly. Um, is there a way to leverage that? Um, so leverage the, leveraging the CRISPR system to um, limit, y yes. Um, so in that case, I suppose you could engineer the bacterium to possess spacers to uh, that would could be used to uh, degrade um, invading uh, plasmids or in, invading genes, really. To yeah, so certainly to invading uh, antibiotic resistance genes, so they could be included um, as a t as a target site using by uh, engineering the bacterium to recognize them the antimicrobial resistance genes. Yeah, that's what comes to top of mind. There may be other other ways of doing it. I'd want to think about it a little bit, but certainly that's what comes to mind immediately. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, there are a lot of people uh, thinking about that type of thing in the chat here. Okay. Um, 
Uh, so here's one. Uh, can you elaborate or speculate on why so many diverse CRISPR-Cas systems evolved? Well, to recognize different uh, phage genomes. Uh, so phage come in all different uh, genome types. Um, so there are double-stranded RNA uh, genomes and um, single-stranded uh, DNA genomes uh, and uh, RNA genomes. And so certainly that could be one reason why they have evolved that way um, is to uh, to protect them, to be able to protect themselves from different uh, bacteria phage that they encounter. All right, I've got one here. Um, I've heard of base editors that employ the CRISPR-Cas system. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, those are really cool. Um, so in those cases, it is the Cas9 protein that's used. But the Cas9 protein has two nuclease domains that enable it to cut double-stranded DNA. So um, in the case of the base editors, the Cas9 protein has been genetically altered so that one of the nuclease domains has been uh, disrupted. And so it cleaves only one of the two strands in the target site. Uh, so it's a nickase. Um, the other really cool thing is that the Cas9 protein is expressed as a fusion protein with um, a, a deaminase, either an adenosine deaminase or a cytosine deaminase that converts in the process of deamination converts the either adenine to guanine or cytosine to uh, thymine. And so the, um, that allows, that enables the system um, to make a single base change at a target site. And so it limits some of the damage that can occur through non-homologous end joining that I explained um, in the lecture. Um, all right, so we've got one here. Uh, how old are the MDX mice embryos when the editing is performed? The, I think well, in the example, yeah. Yeah, no, that, yeah. So I think it's, I think it's importantly, the attempt there is to target them at the single cell stage. Um, and so, and that the idea there is that the uh, the change is made at the single cell stage. So during the subsequent development of the animal, all the cells contain the uh, edited genomes. Um, and so, you know, that isn't always the case. Sometimes before the uh, change is actually made, uh, the cells have already begun dividing. And so sometimes not all of the cells are, are altered, the genomes in all of the cells are altered. So the, the, the goal is to introduce it into the uh, single cell embryo. Great. Um, so you mentioned that CRISPR-Cas systems can be used to control gene expression in cells. How does that work? Yeah, again, another really neat uh, development. Um, so in that case, the uh, a catalytically inactive Cas9 is generated um, by knocking out the nuclease domains. So it's called it's referred to as a dead Cas9. So it doesn't cut, but the it still binds to CRISPR the single guide RNA, and so it's directed to a particular target site. But the Cas9 is expre expressed as a fusion protein with either with a transcription factor that either activates expression of a gene or represses expression of a gene. So it's a really neat system because it has the 
the uh, targeting capability of the CRISPR-Cas system, um, but the transcription, and so that targets it to a particular gene that you would want to activate or repress, and um, yeah, and so you would include the transcription factor for that. All right, let's see. So uh, I think this is in response to uh, CRISPR-Cas not being acceptable for use in human embryos. Can the CRISPR-Cas9 system be used to edit favorable traits in animals and plants? Yes, and it certainly is being used for that purpose. And so in the book, we do include some examples. And so yes, certainly it is through germline editing to um, yeah, so to create um, lines of um, animals that have, um, most of them are production traits, have enhanced production traits. So things like um, larger growth. Um, and so this is being explored, well, actually commercialized in the case of the uh, fish, a couple of fish species that grow bigger than their conventional counterparts. Um, and so, and also to for um, to increase disease resistance in animals. Um, and so, yeah, so that's certainly being explored. Uh, my understanding is that not certainly not all of them have been approved. Uh, approved. So yes, they're being uh, uh, it's being uh, done at the research level, um, but not yet many approvals uh, for human consumption of those livestock animals. Lots and lots of examples uh, for research animals though. Human uh, models of human diseases, for example, in mice and, and um, yeah, non-human primates. Doesn't always work well in all organisms, in all animals. Um, but certainly in many, it's it's quite well used. Yeah, and kind of springboarding off of that one, um, is approval at the discretion of each country or is there a global organization exerting some sort of regulations over this or is it the for, Wild West? For ger germline therapy or for um, somatic cell therapy or, 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 or just in general? Uh, okay, so the regulations in general. Yeah, okay, so regulation no is is currently done country by country. Um, and so it and it depends on what is being edited. Uh, so crops versus livestock or animals or humans. Um, so usually in most countries, including the United States and in Canada, those fall under different uh, uh, different regulatory authorities depending on what you're editing. And so, yeah, that's done country by country currently. However, there are uh, some, there's a consortium that's aiming to try to es establish a global guidelines, uh, particularly for uh, human germline therapy. Um, and yeah, so that we can come to a consensus considering globally all the different perspectives on that topic and coming to a consensus that all countries would um, agree to. But for um, crops, uh, genome editing crops, that's the uh, regulations are different in different countries. Most countries currently do not require approval for crops that have been edited using the CRISPR-Cas system unless a transgene is incorporated. Um, some exceptions to that are the countries in the EU and New Zealand. Um, and um, for uh, livestock editing, uh, approval is typically required. I know in the United States, approval is required. So, but, however, if the risks from that particular, so it's, it's the uh, cases are, are um, evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. 
And so if the uh, editing does not, has very low, is considered to have very low risk, then pre-market approval is not required. And there was an example re very, very recently in the United States of, a, of cattle that are engineered to have what's called a slick coat, and that's to help them cope with heat. And so they were edited using the CRISPR-Cas technology um, and because didn't introduce a transgene, introduced a mutation, a disruptive mutation. And because the that particular mutation in that gene existed in other cattle species, it was considered to be low risk and pre-market approval was not required. So I think appropriately, each case is evaluated individually and um, to determine the risk versus the benefit. Thank you. All right, well, we're getting, uh, we're at time now. So I just wanna thank Dr. Patton for all the excellent information she presented today. And I'd like to thank the audience for all the thoughtful questions and for taking the time to join us today. Uh, just as a reminder, the recording of the presentation will be emailed to you within a few days. And with that, we're going to close out the webinar. Thanks again, Dr. Patton. And, okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone.